Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our NPC talk series. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Dylan Connor today. Um, Dr. Connor received his PhD in geography from University of California at Los Angeles in 2017, and he's currently an assistant professor at the School of Geographical Sciences and um, Planning. Um, oh, at the Arizona State University. Um, his re main research focuses are in immigration and intergenerational mobility, and also looking at how the development of neighborhoods, cities, and regions have an impact on social inequality. Um, today, Dr. Connor will present his work in economic and cultural assimilation in immigrants' enclaves using um, records from the Industrial Removal Office. Um, and I am also very happy to um, hand in our famous MPC coffee mug for today's presentation. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for coming, everybody. I wanted to um, just start with a couple of big thank yous. Um, first of all, to Rachel and Sang Yu for um, organizing the day, and to uh, Dave and Riper for bringing me up. Um, and then I also wanted to make kind of more of a macro level thank you to you know everybody in the room actually who's who's been involved in developing the IPOMS project. I'm sure every speaker who comes thanks you guys for your huge contribution, but I really just wanted to like underscore, you know, how amazing that data is. I so from my time through grad school and into my early career, I've basically solely relied on MPC data. Um, when I do work with that and bring it to geography and to other places, people are blown away with the things that you can do with it. Um, so I really just wanted to like, you know, express my gratitude for both the hard work, but also the generosity in terms of um, putting that stuff out there and letting people like myself um, use that kind of work. So what I'm going to um, present on today is another project that um, builds on data produced at the MPC, the Complete Count Census data, and links it in with um, data from genealogical sources to study the effect of enclaves. So um, let me begin by just setting myself up a little bit in terms of the types of work I've, I've been doing, and then that will be a bit of a launching point for what I'm going to talk about today. So what, what I've worked on in, my, um, in the early stages of my career have basically been studying issues of people and places, and in particular how places come to affect life chances within and across generations um, by using the complete count censuses of the United States and actually linking them in with other data sources, in particular similar complete count data sources for Ireland. Um, so in, in my early projects and in a couple of papers that I have coming out, um, or which are already out this year, um, what I focused on is effectively trying to understand how the places in which migrants are coming from affect what happens to them after migration and then what happens to their children down the road, and then trying in some ways to disentangle this issue of, well, for migrants and their children, is it where they're coming from that's important, or is it where they're going to? So trying to effectively think about the opportunity structures of the sending and receiving context. <coughs> and I've been using a whole range of both um, linkage approaches or cultural measures using names, some of which you'll start to see um, borne out in the project that I'm going to talk about today. Um, just to, to actually put a flag up front, so I'm, I'm totally happy for people to interrupt me as I give the talk, and given, you know, I'm going to actually step through some of the data stuff that I'm doing here, I'm like happy for people to jump in and ask questions or push me a little bit, um, so, so feel free to do that. I'm not sure what the, the norm typically is here. So in this project, which is in collaboration with um, Leah Bustan at Princeton and Ron Abramitsky at Stanford, um, we're, we're pushing on this question, um, which has had a lot of play in the literature, which is trying to understand um, the factors that affect migrant economic and, and cultural assimilation and the assimilation of their children. So in terms of thinking about what factors affect migrants' incorporation into the receiving country, you know, we could think of um, we could think of opportunities or dimensions such as public schooling, churches, and um, the role of living in and outside of ethnic enclaves or living in a gateway city. And what we're going to focus on in this talk is really the issue of living in and outside of enclaves or in gateway cities. That's what we're trying to get some traction on here. And the reason why understanding how neighborhoods affect outcomes is challenging 
is for a couple of reasons. One is straightforward, and that is that the migrants who decide to live in a particular neighborhood might need more help in some respects than the migrants who don't. Okay, so to put that another way, in some respects, if we compare two families or households who are living in different neighborhoods, we can't be certain whether the differences we observe between those families are as a result of the place that they're living in, or if it's something that might have affected the decision or the process that ended up affecting where they ended up settling. Um, so what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to use this organization from the early 20th century known as the Industrial Removal Office, um, which operated out of New York between roughly 1900 and 1920. And I'm going to dig into that in a lot more detail in just a moment. Um, but effectively, this program was specialized in incentivizing migrant households, particularly Jewish immigrant households, to leave New York for other locations outside of the city. Um, so um, as, as, as an upfront flag, I'll forgive anybody who's never heard of this program, because it seems to be one of these programs that's been like buried in history. Um, and most people you know, typically haven't really come across it. But it's kind of like a big scale project. I mean, it moved um, in the region of 100,000 people out of New York in a 20 year period. So it's like a big scale project. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow the participants of that program who basically take part, move to these other locations. We're going to compare them to a, a, a kind of a rough comparison or control group who are going to be other Jewish households living in New York at the time. And we're going to follow them and their children for up to 30 years into the future. So um, let, let me talk a little bit about the Industrial Removal Office and how to think about it. So. Um, the program's operations are heavily focused um, on the Lower East Side of New York, which is a major Jewish enclave at this period. Um, as I'll show you in a moment, they're actually also focused on a number of other neighborhoods, even if that particular neighborhood was the original impetus for setting up the program. They shift around 40,000 households over about 20 years, and they actually moved them to over 1,000 locations throughout the country. So the, the original records um, actually list the individual cities that they moved people to, and actually also the addresses that they moved from. Um, and and what, what, what's really kind of crucial about this program, especially when we compare it to similar perhaps studies that focus on uh, refugee resettlement, for example, today, is actually there's not really a strong, um, there's no compelling force that make the families actually comply with the program. So it's not like these people were only granted entry to the United States under the condition that they moved with this program. In some respects, they actually had to kind of self-select self into the program. So it's not quite a like hard resettlement program where you know we have this great natural experiment. It's something more along the lines or closer to a nudge where there's a small incentive for these families to take part and kind of break loose with the city and, and move somewhere else. So what I'm going to focus on in this talk is I'm going to actually spend quite a bit of time actually talking through the IRO program and you know effectively what we're seeing there, what they were trying to do, who was entering the program. We're going to talk about the work um, that went into actually constructing this data set. So as you'll see, there's actually quite a lot of um, preparation work that went in to actually make those records usable and thus linkable to the decennial census is to try and follow these families over time. And then I'm going to talk about the effects of the program on both on occupation and location, um, some rough measures of perhaps cultural assimilation, um, and then we might get to a revealed preference analysis a little bit just toward the end. OK, so you know, where did a big project like this come along from? So um, there's a quote here by Jacob Rees, and it's effectively a, um, a response to um, a set of uh, field observations where people were going out into the um, ethnic neighborhoods of New York at the turn of the century. Um, and in this quote, they note that the children, the children in immigrant neighborhoods have never seen the Brooklyn Bridge that was scarcely five minutes away. Um, three had only been to Central Park. It was the street with its ash barrels and its dirt, the river that runs fell with mud was their domain. So effectively, there's a sense that these children are kind of growing up in squalor, um, and they're being exposed to these kind of you know, really tough conditions. And in some way, that's affecting their incorporation into US society. Um, I spent a summer at the American Jewish Historical Society effectively reading through the meeting minutes of this organization um, spanning about 20 years to actually get a sense of what was going on and what they were trying to do. 
And it's exactly this kind of discussion that's kind of going on, that's kind of motivating the program, or at least that's how it's being justified. In effect, we need to get people out of these um, neighborhoods because it's kind of inhibiting, you know, what, what, what's going to follow from there. So this is a map of the um, enumeration districts of uh, New York in 1910. Um, what we've done here is we've effectively mapped the um, we've mapped Manhattan and Brooklyn in terms of the Jewish population share of those enumeration districts. Um, and what you can see, what you can pick out really here is that there's effectively um, four main neighborhoods in which the Jewish population is, is really heavily concentrated in New York at this time. You've got the, the Lower East Side, which is you know, really the kind of forefront of what this program is, or, or where this program is trying to target. You've got the, the Williamsburg neighborhood in Brooklyn, and then you've got Brownsville and East Harlem as these kind of more um, outlying communities. And what we actually pick up in the records is that even though a lot of the activity was initially trying to focus on the Lower East Side, what we see in terms of the actual addresses that people are moving from is that actually they're pretty well spread across all of these neighborhoods, particularly as the program develops over time. So in terms of the life course of the program itself, it really picks up around 1899 and it starts to get going um, really right up until 1907. So there's actually an influx of um, uh, refugees from Romania into New York that actually spur this, um, the, the effectively the start of the program, and that it's effectively focused on those migrants initially, and then over the course of three or four years, it just starts to expand and expand, up until about 1907, um, when the re when the recession hits, you see basically both a drying up of the migrant inflow. Um, but also actually a drying up of funds and locations in which the program can actually send people to. So you see that big drop off right after 1907, um, and it picks back up again around 19, uh, I think, 14 or so. So effectively, that kind of that that middle period spanning those two decades is really the peak operation period um, for the for the uh, the organization's activities. So, in terms of what the program actually provided. So I said earlier on that the program was in some way kind of more like a little bit of a nudge rather than like a hard resettlement. Um, effectively what the IRO were offering was, first of all, help with moving expenses. So all of the participants got um, train fare or, or um, assistance with whatever transportation they were using. Um, the IRO ledgers that we use actually record the amount of, um, the number of dollars actually given to each person participant. Um, so the IRO provided like a small incentive to move in that way. And then for each individual case, they were supposed to help with job search and provide effect effectively short-term um, assistance with lodging at the destination location. Um, so we roughly calculate the incentive or the nudge to be around 2% of annual earnings, which might actually seem quite small up front. Um, but my collaborator, Leah Bustan, has been working on effectively comparing our program to a number of other present-day programs, such as uh, there's a program in Bangladesh, for example, focused on incentivizing migration from agricultural regions. And what we actually see is that the incentive level is roughly similar about across all of these programs. And these other programs actually do find longer term effects in terms of actually moving people out of locations. And interestingly, we actually see other parallels with these programs in terms of what we actually see um, play out over time. So what we're thinking in terms of the program itself and why, it's, why it could potentially be effective, well, we're thinking that this small incentive is enough effectively to reduce the uncertainty of moving to another location. So if you're going to pick up and move to some random place outside of New York that you, know, you may or may not have heard of, um, this small incentive, as we'll show, seems to be enough actually to you know, effectively push people <laughs> over the line and maybe kind of compensate with that, um, that, that, that perceived risk of moving to that location. So in terms of where the IRO is sending households, um, this is a map based on the Jewish share of the US population in the 1910 decennial census. Um, what's really clear from this map is that you can see that, um, by and large, the Jewish population is heavily concentrated in New York. You can see that big circle in the map is New York City. 
Um, so you can really see the, the kind of concentration in the northeast. Um, and then when it comes to, act to actually where the IRO were sending families, you can see that particularly in the, the industrial Midwest and in some of those developing western cities, those are absorbing a lot of the people being resettled from this program. But what's, po what's potentially more interesting is not only that the resettlement is focused away from the northeast onto places throughout the country, but you can actually see points across the entire United States pretty much. So in addition to those developing cities, they're actually resettling households to a whole wide range of places, <coughs> sometimes only one or two at a time. Yeah, so I'm curious about the, um, the promise to help out with job search. Um, I'm imagining those people who moved in California early 1900s, <coughs> there's only so much that the authorities or whatever in New York could do. Hmm. Or what, what was the, you know, how, how, uh, how much were they actually helped with the job search? Was that part of the economy? Mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's difficult to say exactly, and I'll, and I'll turn to some of the, the kind of horror stories that come true in terms of what actually happened to people when they moved. Um, but one thing we know from the ledgers is that there is an indication of whether there was kind of like roughly a job secured for that person beforehand. And what you see in terms of the communications between the IRO and whoever they know at the location, you'll often get this instance where, you know, somebody in, in Texas, for example, or there's a small community that doesn't have a barber. And they'll contact the IRO and basically say, we don't have anybody with these skills. Can you send somebody down? And, and that kind of thing is indicated or signaled in some way in the ledgers. My feeling is that in terms of the bigger cities, there's probably not as much of that going on. It's kind of more of a case of just moving people and letting them go. I was just curious. Um, <clears throat> when you say uh, Jews in the 1910 census, you mean Yiddish mother tongue? Or? So, so let, me, let me come back to that. Um, the short answer is yes, but um, let me uh, return to the classification when I get to the data. How much, say, did the participants have in location? Say they had a family in one of those small dots. Could they request to go there, or was it completely Right. So, so, I'm, so I won't present the results on it today, but the ledger does actually, they classify people according to whether they were a direct removal. And a direct removal is somebody who basically went into the office and said, I don't care where you send me, I just want to get out of New York. So can you like find somewhere for me to go? Um, so around half of the cases were people like that. And then the other half is some kind of mix of having some kind of job secured, such as these kind of, um, you know, like the barber example, or people who indicated some kind of preference, like I'm willing to take part in your program, but only if you give me the train fare to Chicago where I know somebody or something like that. And so actually you see um, in a lot of cases, people were trying to move themselves to Boston and Philadelphia, but the program was pretty strict about not letting that happen because the rationale was like, oh, well, you're just recreating the problem that we're trying to solve in some way. Um, so there's definitely a mix in the program. I see somebody there? All right. So um, what's, what's actually pretty fascinating about it, and I think, I think this project has only really been studied qualitatively up to this point. So there's a book of letters or correspondence that, that have been analyzed in terms of the kind of back and forth between either the placement officers in the locations that people are being assigned or the actual families themselves. And at a quick glance at the letters, actually, you see there's a ton of complaints. So people are really unhappy about the conditions that they're being sent to. Um, either the job opportunities are not what they thought they would be, or they're just really having difficulty adjusting to life there. If you actually just you know, drill through newspaper archives a little bit online, you actually get reference of these kind of problems, even in local newspapers. So this is just a, a quick flag which says that destitute men were sent, um, find no work. The only jobs available for um, removal office participants are for strike breakers, basically. So you get these kind of, I'm going to say that what really comes true is that actually the placement of people in particular locations is not particularly careful. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's not clear what the motivations were for actually communities taking these people. Okay, so in terms of um, who participated in the IRO, um, so I've listed here the top five birthplaces, the top five occupations, and then just some overview characteristics of the types of people or the attributes of the people who are moving. 
So about 75% of participants were Russian-born. Um, you can see that the second category below that is, is Romanian-born, and that's pretty much concentrated in the early years of the program. Um, and what you see is that basically the top occupation is just listing of no trade. So effectively, it's, it's kind of like a classic immigrant story in some ways, that it's kind of, um, it's younger men who are entering into the program and effectively are not particularly skilled. You do see um, tailors, carpenters, and people with some level of skill engaging in the program, but really the bulk of it seems to be generally um, laboring type workers who are willing to just kind of take a chance on something. Around 15% of the participants move with a wife, and the wife's name was recorded in the ledger, and we actually use that for some of the linkage. Um, along the way, and around roughly around half are these kind of random movers who are um, shifting to different locations. Okay, so let, let me talk through the steps of building the data set. And, you know, typically in a geography environment, I kind of skip through this a little bit because people want to get to the results, but I think it's helpful to actually step through this and talk through how actually we built up the data set and what we did. So the first step was we had to actually get the records from the American Jewish Historical Society in New York. They had done a little bit of work um, digitizing some attributes, but we had to do a whole lot of work to actually transcribe. We had a team of UCLA undergrads sit down over the course actually of a couple of summers and actually start transcribing the columns um, to characterize the people taking part in the program. Um, we really wanted to create a set of comparison groups, so not just look at what's happening to people within the program, but actually compare program participants potentially to similar <coughs> households who didn't take part in the program um, but were still residing in New York. And there was effectively two important steps that we had to go through to do that. And then we use a set of record linkage techniques, which, which many of you might be familiar with, um, where we follow both the comparison groups and the IRO participants from those ledgers and the 1910 census, which is our comparison year, to 1920, and then we follow their kids forward from 1920 to 1940. Um, so we can gauge actually how the program is actually correlated with um, social and economic outcomes and also location by doing that. So one of the things that we really had on our side was that actually the ledgers are immaculately kept. So I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not the best at reading cursive. So you'll, you'll probably see um, yourself when you're looking at this. It's challenging to figure out the characters. Um, but compared to a lot of other historical manuscripts, actually the ledgers are in really good condition. So once our undergrads kind of had gotten to grips a little bit with the structure, um, the transcription actually went relatively smoothly. Um, one of the kind of challenging aspects is actually in. In different periods, actually, the page is set up differently, so you get different answers to different questions, and actually different questions are asked. Um, so that was a real pain in the neck to deal with. Um, but this is effectively the base document that, that we're building with and working from. So we, we transcribed a whole ton of characteristics, like occupation, the street address you moved from, birthplaces, um, and then different aspects of the, uh, the place you were assigned to, and different aspects of the uh, removal process. So the second big challenge that we faced when trying to build up the comparison group is that actually the decennial censuses um, don't report religion. So we're studying a program that's focused on Jewish households, and there's no um, direct way to try and classify those groups, um, particularly at the time um, that we were doing this when we didn't have um, reports of mother tongue in, in every year. So what we did was we used um, the censuses that did have mother tongue reported for respondents and found respondents that had listed Yiddish as their mother tongue. And then by looking at, based on the probability of first names and last names that you were a Yiddish speaker, we were able to effectively create a name-based classifier where we could classify you as a likely Jewish household or not based on whether you had a very highly Jewish name or a less Jewish name. So you can see that the really highly Jewish name, so just to flag 1.4 was our threshold value in terms of um, above which you were considered a Jewish household, below which you were less likely to be a Jewish household. And you can see names like, um, in the highly Jewish category, you've got names like Abraham Shapiro, Israel Cohen. You know, these are, you know, according to our index, rock solid um, 
really likely to be Jewish households. You can see in this kind of middle band, you've got names like Annie Hoffman or Jenny Miller, which are a bit more borderline. We've done some sensitivity to kind of make that more or less strict, um, but it's not exactly clear that we would think that, that those people are Jewish. Um, and then in terms of the least Jewish names, funnily enough, um, you've got names like James McLaughlin, Patrick O'Connor, um, Margaret Cunningham. Almost the entire bottom tier of non-Jewish on our index is Irish Catholic. Um, so, um, so, so that's effectively how our, our classification was set up. And then once we had that, we were able to screen, we were able to identify Jewish households in the census, and we actually screened our own IRO records to hold them to the same standard in terms of the names that we were using to classify um, likely Jewish households. Okay, so. Um, in terms of um, creating comparison groups, the second big challenge um, was actually trying to take the IRO addresses and actually figure out where these people were moving from. So we wanted to compare um, IRO households who were living in similar neighborhoods to the comparison group that, that we're, we're putting them up against effectively. But all we had to do, all we had from which to do that was the address that was listed in the IRO. So one potential way to do that is you effectively take those addresses which are enumerated from 1900 to 1920 and you could plug them into some kind of contemporary um, geocoder in terms of so basically plugging them into a high powered version of Google Maps and trying to see actually if you took those addresses and um, and try to locate them using a contemporary address locator, you could kind of assume maybe that's actually the place that that household is actually from. But at the same time, I was working on this other project, um, which will, I think is coming out this week, um, where, I was try where I'm trying to study um, neighborhood change. So it's a totally unrelated project. I'm studying neighborhood change across US cities from 1940 to 2010. But one of the insights that I got from that project was that I, I, I have a way of determining whether if you locate an address, a, a 1940 address using a contemporary geolocator, what's effectively the error in that? Okay, so streets change names, um, streets are renumbered. Um, what percentage of those streets that you locate in the pa from the past with a contemporary geolocator are in the wrong place? And what we found in that project is that somewhere between 35 to 40% of addresses, when you put them through a contemporary geolocator, are in the wrong place. So we were, you know, we took that as basically, you know, this is you know, not something we're going to do in this project. So the alternative um, was effectively to take those historical addresses and instead of trying to put them through a contemporary geolocator, actually try to find a similar address in the 1910 historical census from which you can then extract the enumeration district that it was located inside. So we used a comparison, basically a string comparison between the address listed in the IRO records um, to the address listed in the 1910 census, and we do some kind of fuzzy match. We set a threshold for where we think that that's roughly reasonable to classify that. I have a couple of examples here of cases where we're trying to locate um, different households who are on Delancey Street in New York, um, and then effectively try to kind of minimize the, the house number distance between what we match the two um, and what we matched it against. Um, so in this case, um, by and large, Delancey Street actually was a pretty you know, good street to be trying to locate and match from. Um, but there's plenty of other streets where you know, we couldn't quite get the match. You know, but we roughly have about 80% at some kind of reasonable level of accuracy um, located in terms of enumeration district. OK, so um, effectively, the last couple of points and methods before I start to show you what actually happened in the program, um, we effectively used that, that neighborhood classification to look at basically the neighborhoods people were moving from to, ne to the neighborhoods that they moved to, and then how they associate with um, a whole range of characteristics. Um, in terms of the actual sample size itself, um, so the, um, our match rate from the IRO records to the censuses in 1920 and 1940 is roughly in the region of 15%. So it's a 
pretty low match rate. It's similar to what other people are doing um, in terms of linking external data sources to the US Census. Um, but um, and we've, we've kind of increased and rolled off the stringency of those matching in a whole lot of different ways. We included the wife's name, um, and we've done a whole lot of robustness. And what we see actually is that the, um, the results tend not to change. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare <coughs> these linked samples from 1910, 20, and 40 um, to Jewish households that lived in the Lower East Side or another enclave, to Jewish households that lived in New York outside of enclaves, and then to households who lived outside of um, New York. OK, so let me jump into the results um, in terms of and have a look at what we're seeing here. So um, I'm going to show a couple of tables like this. These are measures of the occupational score, which is our um, rough proxy for our income or occupation in our different periods. In 1910, 1920, um, and this column just controls for the baseline 1920 OCK score. So the first thing that we see is that um, the sort of reference category here are Jewish households living in enclaves in New York in 1910. And we're comparing the IRL participants in terms of their OCK score to that group, and then comparing these other groups. And what, what really jumps out is that we see that, the first of all, the Jewish households who are living outside of enclaves in New York are earning around 7% more than the Jewish households living in enclaves in New York. And the IRO households are, are earning 10% less than that group even. Okay, so there's a strong negative selection of households into the program based on their occupation. So in effect, if we think about the program or our assessment of the program as seeing whether these households manage to close that gap over time. What we see in terms of the occupational score is that by 1920, a large portion of that gap has been erased, basically. Between 1910 and 1920, when we pick these households up, the IRO households are roughly at a 2% deficit in terms of occupational-based earnings. Um, but we can also see other forms of convergence among the other groups. So in general, between 10 and 20, we see a kind of a, a, a level of convergence across all groups. And when we control for the baseline occupational score from IRO in terms of earnings, what we see is that participation in the program was roughly associated <laughs> with around a 2% bump in earnings over that 10 to 20 period. So we do see these positive program effects in terms of helping these families move up the ladder. Um, what we see um, particularly strongly is that we see that a lot of that convergence seems to happen between 1910 um, and 1920. Um, but there aren't really strong effects into the second generation. So this, this, the catch-up seems to happen in the 10 to 20 period or in the 1900 to 1920 period. Um, but then things seem to kind of remain pretty stable um, from, from the second genera or from the first generation on to the second generation in that 20 to 40 period. Okay, so if we're thinking about then, okay, so the big occupational effect is that we're seeing that. Um, there is some kind of level of convergence being generated by the program. It does seem to be associated with some improvement in occupational-based earnings. One of the questions that we could start to ask is, well, what, how do we, maybe these households are just motivated enough that this convergence would have happened even without participation, right? So our first cut at trying to understand actually whether this is an effect of the program or something else is that we actually cut the IRO households based on whether on the first follow-up they were still outside New York in 1920. So had they returned basically in that intervening period or had they in some way complied with the program and stayed out? So if you just follow, these are the IRO households that were in New York in 1920. If you follow them across, you can see they start with a 10% deficit. The IRO households who returned to New York have a 4 to 5% deficit in 1920. Um, and the, the differences are kind of, they seem to be erased more or less by the second generation. But note this 4% this, this gap that persists in 1920. If we look at the households who are outside New York in 1920, they also have this big deficit. In terms, it's, it's, a, it's an even bigger deficit. It's an 11% disadvantage in the base period. But they've almost entirely closed the gap by 1920. So effectively, the households that stay outside New York seem to be driving this program benefit. So in some way, actually, compliance with leaving the enclave seems to be strongly associated with um, convergence. And then actually, when we shift into the second generation, we see a further benefit 
on on the second generation who, who, whose parents have complied with the program and stayed outside. But, but there is selection in terms of returning to New York, right? If you fail in your new location, you return to New York. Right. So that, that group that's returning is highly selective mm -hmm. and in a negative way. Right. Um, well, we, we, we think that that's, 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 so do you mean selected on its baseline characteristics or its, or its success outside of New York? Well, there are people who are less likely to succeed based on the baseline characteristics. Um, well, I mean, the, so the baseline occupational scores suggest actually that if we were trying to characterize economic selection, the group who stay outside New York are actually more negatively selected than the group selected who live back. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's, that's possible. And one, one thing that we tried to do was we tried to um, match them on cultural characteristics and other dimensions. And there is some particularly cultural selection in terms of moving back to New York. Um, but at least up front, I think we're, in terms of the occupational characteristics, we're not seeing strong differences in the, in the, in the pre-move. We did some matching stuff, but we, were kind of end, we ended up at roughly, in a roughly similar place. Um, but, but you're right, characterizing the unobservables is, is challenging. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask one question? So these results here, <clears throat> so a lot of those people that moved, they didn't have an occupation in 1910. Right. 20% or something. What happens to results, the results if you were to exclude those people? Because so, I'm assuming yeah. a lot of those will be unemployed, you know. Yeah. They will be the worst of the worst. But what, what about those who actually have an occupation? registered occupation. So, so I, 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 I don't have the numbers off hand of you know, actually how different the results look, but in an appendix table we drop the no trade people <coughs> and everything looks pretty much the same. It doesn't seem to be. Now, it might be that in general the IRO occupations are not a great characterization of the underlying skill, but we're kind of, we're left with that basically as our, but in terms of actually cleaning those people out to make sure they're not driving this, we don't see huge differences between the two groups. Um, okay, so what, what, what those results are suggesting is that actually the location itself um, or the assignment to particular locations might be a factor in affecting the convergence that we're seeing among the program participants. Um, so l let me just talk a little bit about the, um, the, uh, what we actually see in terms of locational outcomes. So um, the really striking fact that we see in terms of location is that, so we've got, we've got two bars here. Um, these, are the, these are the IRO participants, so we'll call them at New York City incentivized, and the gray bar are the households who didn't participate in the IRO program. And then on the um, y-axis, what we've got effectively are the, the share of households who are outside New York in 1920. And what you can see is that over 60% of the IRO households are outside New York on the follow-up. And we can see less than 30% of the um, non-participating Jewish households are still in New York in 1920. So the program does seem to be effective in giving people that shift outside the city. But we find that the assignment location is really not sticky. So somewhere between, only between 10 to 15% of the households are actually in the assignment location that they were sent to. So it seems like, and, and what we actually see in the records is that on a, on a, on, there's a one year follow up. We see that a lot of the households are there within the first nine months when they're followed up. Um, but when we look 10 years later, most of them seem to have moved on and gone to other locations. And there's, I'll show later on perhaps that there are, there are characteristics of the location that seem to be associated with stickiness. But in general, the IRO seems to be like many other programs like Moving to Opportunity, for example, where people move to the location for a short period and then move on later on. Um, so what we wanted to do from there was actually think about, well, actually, if we see this occupational convergence and it seems to be associated with leaving New York, which is actually the big high-earning enclave at this time, you know, what, what could be driving that, that process of convergence? So what we do here is we simply look at the neighborhood characteristics of IRO households in 1910 relative to the comparison group, and then the IRO households in 1920 relative to the comparison group. Um, so the, the, the effectively the darker bars are the before results, and the gray bars are the after results. Um, and then we're comparing them on the Jewish share of the, of the neighborhood or the enumeration district 
the white collar share of that Jewish population, so a marker of um, occupational status of the neighborhood, the English speaking share, and the home ownership rate. And what you can see is that in um, the base period, these IRO households are living in roughly similarly Jewish neighborhoods as the comparison group in 1910, but the program has a big effect in reducing the Jewish share by 1920. So you can see that big drop. So in effect, it does seem to have some effect in moving them out of ethnic neighborhoods. In terms of the Jewish white collar share, though, you actually see the reverse. So the IRO households actually start behind. They're coming from the poorest neighborhoods in New York. Um, but by 1920, the actual average occupational status of the Jewish households in their neighborhood has actually increased um, above um, what happens in the comparison group. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with the English-speaking share of the neighborhood, there's a big shift in terms of the before and after, um, and likewise in the home ownership rate. And a lot of these characteristics are associated with upward occupational mobility. So what we're suggesting is that these households are leaving the big enclave, and they're effectively moving to more integrated and higher status neighborhoods in other places. And then we're seeing that kind of occupational catch up over the same time. Um, how am I doing on time? A few minutes? OK. <laughs> um, OK, so what we're seeing is that the program does generate convergence. We're seeing a big shift in the types of neighborhoods that people are leaving. It's not like they're just leaving and then resettling in similar places once they go out. And it's not like they're actually just all moving back to New York either. What we also wanted to look at was in terms of more cultural characteristics, do we actually see an effect of being moved out of um, the enclave in those dimensions? So clearly measuring this kind of cultural assimilation process is, is not easy. So we kind of just have a couple of rough measures that we try to take to try and characterize that. So in some ways, we have, a, we have a measure of the Jewishness of the name based on that Jewish index I showed earlier. So let's take that as kind of a, the Jewishness of your name in the base period is like a rough proxy, perhaps, of your cultural selection into the program. Okay, so we're going to see whether you have an extremely Jewish name or a less Jewish name in the base period. We're going to look at how Jewish your wife's name is or the, the probability that she's likely Jewish on the first follow-up in 1920. And then we're going to look at the types of names that the participants are giving to their kids um, in 1920 as well. So I've split this basically again by whether the households are back in New York in 1920 or whether they're outside New York in 1920. And the first thing to note is the decision to move back to New York is positively correlated with the Jewishness of your name. So in effect, what we, what we think we're seeing is that it's some kind of signal that people who are more perhaps culturally embedded in their communities um, seem to exhibit this higher probability, even controlling for occupational and, and other characteristics to move back to New York. We see that the households outside of New York are less likely to marry a Jewish woman. Um, so we're seeing this, you know, this um, what would often be characterized as kind of like a cultural assimilation project process. There's no difference in the probability of marrying a Jewish woman for households who move back to New York. But what's interesting about the kids' names is that we pretty much detect no difference um, in terms of how these different households are naming their kids before and after the move. Um, so you can see effectively that the selection into the program is almost identical to the probability that you give your kid a Jewish name um, over that same period and in the two. So what we're what we're in what we're inferring from this is that with the exception of the probability of marrying a Jewish woman when you're outside of New York, um, which in some ways might be kind of like a, a supply process, at least what we're seeing in terms of these cultural signals is that actually you don't see some radical cultural shift in how people are naming their kids um, before and after. Um, you do see shifts in neighborhoods, um, but that's our, our best cut. OK, so let me just wrap up, um, given that I'm short on time. Um, so what we generally observe in the program in terms of summary is that we see that, in general, Jewish households earn more in the enclave city. So that's effectively our first descriptive observation, that independent of IRO, earnings are higher among Jewish households in the big gateway. But we see that these IRO households are being effectively negatively selected from that um, 
high intensity congested labor market and they're effectively taking the option to move out. And then what we see is that those negatively selected households effectively improve their occupational status and there's strong suggestion in the data that they might be doing that by moving to effectively more integrated neighborhoods and perhaps um, more open labor markets so that, that are not affected by the, effectively the, the kind of grinding poverty and intensity of that kind of busy New York enclave. We don't see very strong effects on cultural assimilation independent on that probability of marrying um, a Jewish woman. Um, so what we're seeing is that the program in general seems to be pretty effective um, in terms of generating what it was trying to do um, with the strong caveat that um, the places that people get sent to are extremely non-sticky. So it seems like these households effectively, they do move out of New York. The program is effective in shifting people out of these neighborhoods, but they seem to strongly re-optimize in some way on location within a short period and move to somewhere else. So then, thinking through then what this tells us or how we should then think about um, these enclave effects, is that what we see is that we have these struggling households that respond to this IRO nudge. Um, when, they in, when they leave, um, uh, they seem to improve in terms of a range of outcomes or they improve a range of their own outcomes. Um, and what this is suggesting to us in general is that on the one hand, so I started with that problem, which is that trying to study neighborhood differences is kind of um, strongly affected by this issue that the decision to live in a particular location is confounded with the actual attributes of the, the place. I think what our findings are suggesting is that not only is that bundled together, but we need to think about these neighborhoods more generally as being bundles. So on the one hand, there's a lot of work showing that enclaves might be beneficial in a whole range of ways, particularly for households that are struggling. But in this case, and perhaps in many other cases, if you want to take that access to the co-ethnics and the, the ethnic enclave, you also have to take with that all of the negative externalities of living in that big, busy neighborhood, which is extremely congested. Public health is really poor. Um, and what we're seeing is that we have this, this effectively a bundling of both the neighborhood and its, its, its ethnicity to some extent. Um, so in short, um, our findings suggest that enclaves might help, that's suggested in the data, um, but there are many other dimensions of neighborhoods that we need to take into account to try and, and, and parse out effectively the, the, the true effect of living in an enclave or being exposed to a particular place. Um, so in terms of the work itself, um, we're, we're at the stage where we're, we're writing that up um, and we're hoping to submit soon, so it's, it's actually a great time for feedback and thinking through um, some of the ideas and arguments. Um, thanks for listening. Characteristics of neighborhoods that I, like cause them to be more sticky. Yeah. Did I miss that, or is there? So, so I, I skipped it in the interest of time, but oh, I can, okay. I can. Do you, do you want me to, to show you what that is? Uh, I'm yeah. curious, but. Um, so, the 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 single strongest factor that we see in terms of stickiness, in terms of actually, let me give you the geography first. The further west you go, the more likely the household is to not return to New York. So California, Colorado, um, Washington, these are very sticky locations in terms of the program. Um, in terms of the actual attributes of the places, so if we take distance from New York out of the equation, it's not actually the Jewish share that makes it very sticky in terms of horse racing these characteristics. It's actually the foreign-born share of the location. So if we're thinking about what these households might be valuing in terms of characteristics, um, it, it's potentially either um, living in a more diverse place in some way, or perhaps being attracted to the same things that other immigrant groups are being attracted to, right? We don't actually see a very strong effect of moving to a, a Jewish enclave outside of New York in, in keeping the people there. So, in short, the further away from New York, the more likely you are to stay, and then the more, the higher the foreign born share of those locations, likewise. Um. Thank you. This was really interesting, and I'm, I'm going to out myself as a, as a, from the other uh, side of the campus, as it were. I'm a historian uh, from the history department, uh, in, and I work in Jewish history. Um, and this, this is really fascinating to me methodologically. And I'm wondering if you could, you, one thing that, that jumped out at me is that you said um, 
uh, offhand that this the IRO has only been studied qualitatively, right. not quantitatively, but <laughs> is so fascinating to me as historians to think like, oh, that's the other side of the coin here. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just reflect on what what your project might bring, let's say, this isn't the case, but let's say my project were, I'm writing about Jewish immigrant history in New York in the early 20th century as a, as a cultural historian. Right. What might your project uh, add to a historian's qualitative analysis and vice versa? What, what, how has the qualitative historical analysis of the IRO or Jewish immigrant life in New York mm. impacted the way that you've shaped your methodology? Right. So, so, so I think the, the biggest place where I've thought about this is in terms of the thinking through actually what happened to the families after they left. Mm -hmm. So the, the book that actually leverages the letters and the correspondence between participants and the program um, is, is really well researched, it's fascinating, there's a ton of detail there, but it gives this really strong picture that the program was a total disaster. Right, so you, you read these complaints and these letters and you think, oh, you know, well, you know, that's, you know, maybe the program, you know, was a complete failure. Um, so in that sense, I think our findings are in some way or our conclusion would diverge from that a little bit. Um, but where that's helpful is actually trying to understand, because when we first found that actually these locations are not sticky at all, we were thinking, you know, is that, you know, is that some weird data thing, or is that like, is there something else going on there? But then when we start seeing these reams of reports of people being unhappy with the place they were initially sent to, it kind of, it, it made a lot of sense. They get sent to these locations, they aren't happy there, but then once they're out, they seem to move somewhere else after that. So I, I think that that's probably the best case where I've had a little bit of back and forth in trying to think through that. Thanks. Have you done this like stickiness analysis for people who had an indication of where they wanted to go versus not? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the, let's say the random movers, the people who just went in and said send me anywhere, they are by far the most likely to move back to New York. And what would be their like, like what is the probability that, they, that any given household that is a random mover moves? Ten percent or fifty percent moves back to New York or to any location. Or anywhere else. Um, I mean, I would say I, I don't I don't know the share that move back to New York among the random movers, but I would say you know at least I'd say ninety percent of the random movers oh. are not in the place that they were sent to within ten years. Um, yeah. I, I got a little bit lost in, in the comparison baseline group, right? Oh, yeah. You're kind of identifying, and then you're you're following that baseline to 1920 as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're linking the people in the baseline longitudinally to 1920, right? Yeah. So okay, all, all of these before and after neighborhoods. Yeah. These are the 1910 or the baseline IRO people against the baseline comparison group. Yeah. And this is the 1920. Same people identified in against the 19th baseline. Follow. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. That's good. So they're all aging 10 years, right? I mean, <coughs> obviously, uh, everybody in, in your baseline then is, you're not just comparing the neighborhoods 10 years apart, right? Right, exactly. So we allow, that's it. So we allow for movement in the comparison group too. Right. So it's not like we're just saying, oh, let's look at the IRO people ten years later and compare them to the, the comparison Good. group ten years before. Good. Yeah. So they're all shifting together. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, your unit of analysis is households in this, but you said almost half of them are single men. Right? Yeah. Okay, and then um, some percentage of them have a wife with them. So is there like a? I guess there's like two sides. Of what I want to say, like one is. Is there a share of like single women that were traveling, or like something that is like a household that isn't a man traveling with a wife, but also isn't a man alone? I was just wondering, also, I guess because the second part of it is that you continually refer to them in households, but like there was one table where you have like the name of the house, like of your own name, yeah. and then the name of the wife, and then of the child, and so your own. I'm assuming is a man, but that was kind of like implicit in there. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, there is a very small share of women who move alone through the program. Um, the issue there is we can't follow them because of the record linkage. So we're pretty much exclusively focused on 
the men who are moving and it's, it's not actually primarily because the program was mainly focused on men but it's really just the record <coughs> linkage problem of women changing their names before and after marriage um, and so on and so forth and we actually only pick up for example the names of the wives in the single cross sections that we observe. So in 1920, when we follow them, we can look inside the household and see who they've married. Um, and then when it comes to following the kids, we actually only follow sons as well. Um, so when you're looking at their names and like how to change their names, are you only looking at their first names, like of the wives that they marry, or do you have their maiden names? Um, so we, we only choose the first names, but that's more because of um, well, one is the name changing through marriage, but one is we wanted to make it comparable to the names of kids, because you choose the names of your kids, right? They're, you choose their first names, but you don't necessarily choose their last names. So we wanted to allow for some kind of movement in your preference for a particular first name. Okay. Yeah. I just wonder why on that table you say like O name instead of man's name or like husband's name. Uh, I, I could do that. I, I, do you mean? Uh, yeah, just because it kind of makes it seem like the subject is, you know, like by default. Oh yeah, like here I say on yeah, name. Yeah, like on name and then wife, but like wife isn't like a subject, like it's not. I see, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think I was just, I, I didn't put too much thought into that, I, I think I just typed it out. Um, okay. But yeah, thanks for that. So you know year of arrival, the 1910 census. Are these IRO, IRO uh, individuals recently arrived? Are they just off the boat, or are they been around for years? Or um, they're, they're a real mixed bag. Mm -hmm. So there's some that move, like there was actually an IRO guy at the port of departure and was trying to funnel people into the program yeah. before they even hit New York. Um, so there's, they're a wide range. And I'm just wondering how that compares to your baseline. Right yeah, there. so that's, um, one of the real challenges is that we observed the IRO people from 1900 to 1920. Yeah. And you could arrive in 1914, <coughs> which would mean that you're actually from a different arrival cohort than the comparison group. Yeah. Um, we couldn't think of a clever way to solve that. We, yeah. we tried to restrict based on age to try and get roughly similar people, mm -hmm. but yeah. we couldn't get over the fact that we observed these people in different years. Um, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a good point. It's, it's, uh, Think more about how to yeah, robustness that. that. But <laughs> was there was question at the back? Oh, sorry. More questions? All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming.